uh, Paisley Caves in Eastern Oregon was um, in an area that is now very arid, but 12,000 years ago, 13,000 years ago, it was an island and a lake and people were living in this cave. And this is a site that was predate, predates Clovis. I mean, we have copper lights, human copper lights that, were, that we were able to test and, and get dates from um, beautiful artifacts that normally would uh, you know, disintegrate because of the environment. But because of the arid uh, climate in that region, you have sandals, you have cordage, you have these really precious artifacts that are often lost. And, and then just the stone material culture, you know, that's how we typically in North America, we date our sites based on the stone culture and the types of projectile points, the types of spear points and arrow points. And that's kind of our chronology. And it's flawed because so many different regions had different styles and it's hard to really lump them into dates. But in general, you know, Clovis has always been considered the most, uh, I guess, sophisticated technique and it, everything that kind of followed uh, became smaller and smaller and, and that may be a reflection of the climate change and the dial of the megafauna where you don't need such big weapons to hunt smaller animals um, so that you know paisley caves was uh, one of the big ones that kind of at least shed light on this pre-clovis uh, society and i think a lot of the sites that are on the um the High Cascade area of Oregon. So what separates Western Oregon from Eastern Oregon, you have these upland lake sites. And clearly they've been utilized for eight, 9,000 years. And you have clear chronostratigraphic markers. Uh, you have ash deposits that you can measure at the time between occupations of these sites. And they go back and, and you know, I think lakes, freshwater sources, springs, aquifers, those are always gonna be the places that attract because it's a fresh source of water. Animals are attracted to it, so you have that uh, resource coming in there that you can hunt. Plants are growing because of the water, so you have another resource to make basketry, to make, uh, you know, habitation, uh, to build your houses, to build your, you know, pit houses. And those are the sites that I'm fascinated with and I like to investigate. And I think there's still a lot more work that can be done with looking at these upland cascade sites and that's kind of an area that I want to focus more on um, in terms of even more ancient I guess societies or, or, or peopling in North America there's a lot more work to be done and I think it's going to be offshore I think it's looking at submerged sites and uh, Oregon State University recently did a survey off the Oregon coast looking at paleo landscapes looking at what was above sea level identifying areas of high probability for finding um, archaeological evidence of people. And, and typically it's long old river channels, uh, you know, where we would find people today. You want to look at these areas. I mean, where do you want to build a house? Where do you want to try to find resources? And it's going to be the same places that we live today. And so you just look at that underwater and then it's like, you know, finding a needle in a haystack because you do some coring and you hope do you find something that can give you evidence that there was some sort of human habitation in these sites? And it's hard. And, you know, I think they're still processing a lot of the core data, so we don't know the results of that yet. But if they do find something, then that's exciting. You know, that just kind of takes the story back to uh, another era. What we're finding underwater not in North America, but kind of on a global scale, is we're finding structures. I mean, we're finding stone structures, we're finding uh, stone circles in the Black Sea, we're finding uh, possible structures off the Azores, we're finding structures in Lake Titicaca, we're finding all of these structures that were at one point above sea level, and at some point as the ice age ended and, and the ice caps melted and sea levels rose, these things became covered in water and flooded. And the people that were living there had to migrate somewhere else. So you're finding not only these structures, but you're also seeing the the DNA evidence, the genetic spread of people, and the stories. You know, the stories of the flood, which is prevalent among most uh, societies around the world. So it's a global phenomenon that's happening at this time. And I think as people are getting dispersed, they're carrying this message, and they're carrying their own practices, their own cultural practices, their own beliefs. And it's mixing with other belief systems from other people that they're encountering. And then they form societies, new societies, and that have, you know, mixtures from other societies. So it's, it's kind of a messy picture, but it's interesting because 
people are definitely spreading ideas and that's why you can see similarities uh, among different cultures in remote parts of the world that are disconnected geographically. Well, I think we have to give ourselves more credit as a species. I, I, and I think, you know, my wife will say this. She's like, well, what happens if you find something that's 20,000 years older than you think it is? Who cares? I'm like, well, that just shows that how, how ingenious we were. I mean, that we were, that we kind of came out of the womb ready to go. And, you know, we adapted to our environment and we found out that we needed to form a very close relationship with the environment, with nature. And through that, we could really excel. And, and I think that's important when you look back at these older sites and realize that there is a, there's a trend, there's a pattern. There's a, a point where we are very connected to uh, some source, you know, whether that's a god or the universe or whatever, but there is this connection that's very strong in these ancient cultures. And you can see it in the architecture, you can see it in the writings, you can see it in the uh, cultural material. And at some point through all of these cultures, that gets broken. That connection gets broken and it gets lost and you see the steady decay of that society and eventual collapse. So I think that's secular. And I think that's important for us today to look at because we don't wanna fall into the same patterns. And unfortunately we kind of are with our current uh, progression, but I think it's important because we don't have to do that. You know, We don't have to fall for the same sort of um, I don't know, reliance on technology or, or just losing that connection, losing the link that's a necessity for humans to be living in the natural world. I mean, animals are here with us. They're sharing this planet with us, you know, and there's a relationship that there's the idea that we're the dominant species and that we should take domain over everything and that we consume everything and that we just build, 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 and expand our empire into this global monster. And eventually we're gonna run out of space. We're gonna run out of resources. We're gonna run out of uh, just energy. I think we're just gonna deplete ourselves and we don't want that to happen. So we need to really take a step back and maybe appreciate these ancient cultures because at some point it was very simple. You know, it was a very simple society of understanding that what you take from the, what you take from nature, you need to give back to nature. We're the stewards of this planet. And I think that's something that the, the ancients knew and they respected and they revered. And we need to give back to that. So looking at these ancient cultures and, and it doesn't matter if we're 200,000 years old or a million years old, it's important to know that we're here for the long run, hopefully, and that if we want to keep going, we need to get back to having that connection.